We're going to start tonight with our uh, RDA agreement. So, um, hold on just one second here. Okay. Okay. Well, That's Gary. Okay, you're good. Am I messing things up? Okay, <laughs> so I'll start over. <laughs> um, like I said, I'd like to welcome everybody out this evening. Uh, tonight, we actually have three different types of meeting going on. Our first one will need to be our redevelopment agency meeting. And so with that, council, I'm going to need, uh, need us to open up that meeting. And then I, it looks like we have one set of meeting, uh, minutes that we need to adopt. And then we'll have a presentation by Mr. Long Quell. So can we open and make a motion on the minutes? It's, okay, so I make a, a mayor, a Madam Mayor, make a motion that we open the RDA for tonight and that we approve the minutes of the meeting of the Redevelopment Agency um, meeting October 1st, 2020, as written. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, hear the presentation then by Mr. Long Crow. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, what you have in front of you tonight is resolution 20-06, and that is for the conveyance of real property from the city of Layton. Uh, the slide in front of you right now, let me see if I can get this to work. So you're not looking on the other stuff. Uh, there's a process when you transfer property. Can you hear this? It's cutting in and out? Okay. Uh, and that's in front of you right there. Um, basically, the first step of this process is to uh, to have the land transfer that the redevelopment agency is being requested with this uh, resolution to accept. Gary. Is it Gary? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well. I don't know that he can mute his phone, or we can't mute him from in here, so I guess we'll just have to just know that that's what we're dealing with tonight, but kind of proceed. Okay. So, Gary, if you can hear us, try not to make any <laughs> rumbling of your paper or, or uh, pen or anything like that, because we can hear it very loud in the chambers. Now, so, I'm going to go ahead and mute my phone. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let me uh, re recompose myself here. Yes, but, uh, <laughs> sorry, Lon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. Uh, so this resolution is basically an acceptance of the conveyance of real property uh, from Leighton City to the RDA. In this process, uh, it'll begin with the transfer of property, and, and this resolution will be contingent upon the City Council uh, adopting their resolution to do the same. Uh, this first step is to transfer the property. Following that, we will determine uh, the method for how we want to develop the property. Uh, and then any process that includes the developer will be a public process uh, that will also come in front of the city council or in the RDA, or the RDA at minimum. Um, following that, there will be an agreement to the development of land uh, with the preferred developer and a public process in that agreement. Um, which will also include a provision to reimburse the city for the land conveyed. <coughs> the, the RDA will be able to determine the best route for that. Uh, and then obviously we will approve the plans. The vision that we have that um, you can see in front of you, this was put together by members of staff. Uh, a lot of people wonder 
why we would do this. Um, there's a lot more flexibility if the RDA is in control of the property. Um, we're able to actually work with the developer. We can be involved in everything from the design to uh, the, the process of what's constructed and how it's constructed uh, more comprehensively than we would otherwise through a regular zoning process. Uh, but you can see that there's there's a lot of uh, benefits and reasons why the, the RDA would like to uh, control the property rather than the city. The property that uh, is proposed to be conveyed is five properties on Gentile Street, uh, one on Church, address-wise anyway, and the parcels are there in front of you on the screen. It's about 2.96 acres and five separate parcels. We had the property appraised. Uh, that was completed on October 28th. Those five parcels came back with a value of 2.2 million, uh, about 740,000 square or dollars uh, an acre. 740,000 dollars an acre. Staff is recommending that the RDA consider adopting resolution 20-06. Uh, again, that's contingent upon the Leighton City Council approval of, a, of resolution 20-72, which will come back at a future time. Uh, that will be, this resolution before you will be to accept the five parcels um, of real property, and those will be transferred through a quick claim deed, which uh, you have in front of you as well. Are there any questions? Okay. Council, do you have any comments or question regarding this property or what we we're proposed here? I just have one line. So in it, in when it talks about the exposure time, it talks about um, after considering the subject property, an exposure time towards the middle of the range was indicated. Therefore, a six-month exposure time has been estimated and applied to the subject property. So what all does that really mean? It, you think it'll sell in six months or... Or what's, what does all that mean, exposure time? That's from the appraiser. That's what you're quoting. Uh, I don't know what he meant by that. I actually have held an appraisal license, and I know that you're supposed to find property that has sold within six months when you do your appraisal, and that's probably what he's referring to. Okay. If you don't find enough property, then you, you go out further until you do, but the preference is less than six months. Okay. Okay, hey, council, any other questions? Okay, very good. Then I'll look for some action, uh, re accepting the uh, quick claim deed from Leighton City Corporation for the transfer of certain real property, which was identified here, to the RDA. Madam Mayor, I'll make the motion to accept RDA resolution 20-06. Accepting the quick claim deed from Layton City Corporation for the transfer of the property discussed. And I'll second it. It's been moved and second. Since uh, this does not, this does require funding, so I'm going to take an individual roll call vote on this. Councilman Day? Yes. Councilman Bloxham? Yes. Councilman Fitzpatrick? Yes. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Thomas? Yep. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you, Council. Okay, that concludes our items of discussion for the uh, redevelopment meeting. So I'd look for a motion to close. Can I make a motion to close okay. the redevelopment meeting? Okay. Second. second. It's been moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll now move on. Sorry, this is. We'll now move on to our uh, regular work meeting. Oops, okay, sorry. <laughs> I forget you got a transfer. <laughs> My computer's very slow today, I don't know Thank you. We'll now move into our work meeting for December 17th, 2020. And uh, with that, uh, Council, does anyone have any reports they'd like to report on? 
Okay, Councilman Day. Yeah, I will this time, Mayor. Uh, a couple days ago, I had the honor of representing the mayor at the Reese Across America program at the uh, Veterans Wall, which was a very nice program for the veterans on that day. It was in place of the State Capitol one because the State Capitol was closed. Um, it was a very nice program, as always, with those people. Um, just one point, Alex, I'd like to bring up with you is it was brought up to me by a couple of the uh, veterans there that some of the panels on the wall, especially the big tall ones, are starting to come loose in the middle. They're starting to bow out a little bit, and I think it would be wise if we look at that and maybe put a couple screws to secure those. And I can see where that might take place because I was there when we were installing and they actually used a two-way tape and that was recommended by the manufacturer to do it that way. But, uh, yeah, that, I'm They're sure Ryan, the Ryan Pickup's very familiar with that wall. so. <laughs> You They're held exactly. on the top and the bottom, but the big ones are starting to bow out just a hair, and if the wind or something comes or things start to get behind them, it could yeah. be a problem in the future. Yeah. Well, that's that's great observation, so thank you. Okay, Council, does anybody else have anything? I, I have a few updates. Uh, firstly, the, the mayor and I met with the uh, independent auditor and members of the audit committee uh, just before we met here. Um, the two gentlemen from the community that we um, agreed to have a, help us out, and it was very productive meeting. Um, the staff were prepared with the information, and the independent auditor went through the the report and gave a the city a thumbs up, said that we were doing about as good as we could, um, and that he didn't have any major issues. Uh, the two gentlemen from the from the community who we've asked to be a part of this um, committee who have experience in that field added some tremendous depth to it. Uh, you know, the mayor and I are not financial professionals, um, and so to have two people from the community who are professionals be able to ask the auditor questions um, about what, they, what do you think we, should, we can do better, how do you think we can improve, are there any, in, any, any areas where you think we're, we're falling short, um, it was just very productive. And so I, I, I told the mayor beforehand that I'm very grateful to have those two gentlemen on the on the committee because it functions exactly how it should because we need to know from an independent standpoint from the auditor how the city's doing and it's nice to have someone ask, be able to ask questions to the independent auditor that we might not think of ourselves. And so um, had no issues there and just wanted to pass that, that along to you. Um, Before you go on to yeah, your next ahead. item, let, let me just acknowledge the two gentlemen. It was uh, Doug Bellestrand and, and Van Christensen and um, I know we'd shared with the last time when we selected those two their credentials and and i was very much impressed i'm not going to repeat anything that um zach has said but uh, yes i think they did an excellent job i think you can feel very secure in knowing that we've got an extra set of eyes now yeah and then uh, secondly councilman morris and i are on the league of cities and towns uh legislative affairs committee and so we know that they've started discussing that as say uh, issues that might affect us as a city, um, both on the legislative side and the executive side. So we're starting to be privy to those conversations um, and we will update you as we go along and as we feel like there might be avenues for fellow councilmen and women to be able to maybe reach out to, to the elected officials in our area to, to do that. The, they're asking us since it's gonna be all remote that personal communications are going to be even more important. So the fact that we have good relationships or with, with Representative Handy, um, with uh, Jerry, Stevenson. Jerry Stevenson, Stuart Adams, Stuart Adams uh, Speaker, of the House, Speaker right. of the House Wilson, there's lots of pretty important players in just our area. Um, and so I think we as a council can do our part if we're asked to. And we'll make sure we pass on that information whenever the the league decides to, to share with us the full breadth of what's going on and what bills might be might be put forward. Can I just make a quick comment too? I've had um, need over the last month or so on some other issues to contact Representative Handy or um, Senator um, Adams, and they've been extremely responsive in getting right back to me and, and helping with the questions I've asked and stuff like that. So I think they're really gonna listen to us. Yeah. That's been my experience too. Um, they've 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 sat here. You know they know what what cities need, and so it's nice to have 
uh, fellow elected representatives at the state legislature who kind of know what we what we need and what we would be worried about. And so, yeah, I agree with you, Council Member Fitzpatrick, very much. Okay, and 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 gentlemen, if you see that on uh, an agenda item coming up that you feel like perhaps there's an item that the rest of them need to maybe listen in on, let them know because certainly you know any of us can join that Zoom call, yeah. but. You know, our, our, our two representatives is Councilman Morrison, Bloxham, but the rest of us, you, you can sit in on those. Okay. Mr. Morrison. Yeah, just a, just a note from what Council Member Bloxham mentioned. There are some bills that were reviewed that day, uh, early filings, I guess you'd say, and I'm sure Gary also knows about them. A few city mandated kind of municipal mandate kind of bills that will have to be <laughs> vetted and and gone through. Uh, we also had a Utopia monthly meeting this last week, the board meeting, and it seems like it's a kind of a broken record with me. They're doing really well. Uh, as far as they, they set a pretty aggressive goal of, of 7,000 subscribers, the, excuse me, through the system for this year, and they're almost at 10,000. So they. It's just growing uh, tremendously. Here in Layton, the, the take rate is, like I mentioned before, it's, it's around 34%, which is, we like that. Um, but it's available. It's ready to go throughout the city. Take advantage of that high speed, and especially with kids at home and, and working from home, that's the way to go if you want speed. Clint, I got a question for yeah. you. I keep hearing that it's available everywhere, but I keep seeing them pulling fiber on West Gentile. So how close are we to really actually being there? Where was that on West Gentile? Right on Ronald Avenue area. Well, we'll check. <coughs> but Tracy's got a... I actually heard a comment on that, and the one reason they had to pull extra fiber down Gentile is the original fiber was full. And so they had to pull an additional fiber down the road so that they could keep up with the growth. Excellent. Well, um, I will make just one quick comment. Thank goodness. Um, I know the past council, just the recent past council, I mean, they fought very hard to get a plan put together and, uh, and to be able to have the fiber to all the homes. And the goal that that decision was made on was that to reach 30%. So I'm happy to hear that we have exceeded that goal. And it sounds like it will continue to climb as well. So. I guess thank you to the past council members as well. Okay, any other comments for your updates? Very good, then we'll go ahead and move on. I understand we will not have to go through a training moment tonight. <laughs> no, so I, wish, your Christmas I wish you wouldn't put it that way. <laughs> Merry Christmas from Gary, no. <laughs> um, thank you, council. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go ahead and move on to item number three, which is the uh, comprehensive annual financial report for Mr. Probert. Mayor, members of the council, it's my pleasure to be with you tonight and to finalize June 30th, 2020. I realize we're in December, but every year the state requires that an annual audit be performed. You've hired independent auditors. Uh, Mr. Robert Wood from HBME is here tonight to present his reports from the audit. And I'll take a few minutes just to go over uh, some of the financial results from June 30. And then also I have a couple of slides. I'll stop midway and let him present his reports and then I'll continue on with a couple of slides of how we're doing this particular year as well. But the comprehensive annual financial report, uh, about a 160 page report. A few of the highlights of that, if you were to want to just, you know, what should I really look at inside this thing, would be, uh, you know, pages 11 to 21 are management's discussion and analysis. And that gives you an overview of every aspect of the city and how it's doing and, and it's written more just in, uh, so that anybody can read it, not just accountants. And um, so that's a good part. Page 25 is the governmental financial statements, in particular the general fund. You hear us talk a lot about the general fund because that's the fund that collects all the taxes and that's where we pay for most of the general operations of the city. And so that's a good one to look at when you get, uh, you know, in your spare time over the holidays when you need something to do. But um, 
Page 31 covers the enterprise funds, and we've been here in front of you many times talking about water, sewer, storm, refuse, street light, uh, emergency medical, all of those types of operations of the city. And so those financial statements start on page 31. Then uh, one that I like, and most cities don't present this, starts on page 76 and goes uh, quite a ways are comparative financial statements. Uh, if you're in the business world, you're required to issue comparative financial statements, and there's a reason for that, because it's good analysis to be able to look down the financial statements and see where you were last year and where you are this year, and then ask questions about, well, why did that change, right? Why is this higher or lower or what, you know, what happened here? So uh, the Prior finance director started a tradition of having those in there, even though they're not required, but I continued that because I like having them in there. I think they're very useful financial statements. And so if you were to go in and look for uh, the general fund, you could go to page 76 and see here is the general fund in a comparative form. Um, the other section that might be of interest to you is the statistical section towards the back. That starts on page 120. and it's a required part of a, of a comprehensive annual financial report that's being submitted for the award from the Accounting Association. And it gives 10-year comparisons of different numbers. And so then you can really start to see trends of revenues and expenses, assets, different things like that. And so that's always useful information. Uh, in the middle of all that are some footnotes the footnotes are meant to give you more detailed explanation of the numbers that are on the financial statements. Uh, not my favorite part of the reading if I want to do a high level. So anyway, those are some of the highlights of what is made up you know, in this book. In addition, the independent auditor's report is in here and auditor's report on internal control and also state compliance. And Mr. Wood will cover those here in, in just a minute. Um, for starters, we could go through and look at the general fund revenues. And so on these slides that I'm presenting, you know, we can see in this column we have 2019 actual compared to 2020 actual. And as we look down through those, there's some big numbers. You know, the, the property tax went up 1.7 million. Well, we were aware that it was going to go up. We had the property tax increase that went into effect during 2020. And that was to, you know, go up to about 1.2 to 1.21 million. So you can see that we've also got a lot of new growth revenue that came in. And I think that that started to catch up after years and years of growth. It starts to cycle itself into the city and catch up. And so, you know, we had potentially an extra $500,000 in property tax revenue from new growth in the city. The sales tax revenue, actual to actual, compared up 826,000. Now, of course, we were all in those meetings in March and April, and we were wondering, well, what's going to happen? And, and as was reported in the audit committee meeting, there's been not hardly any cities along the Wasatch Front that have experienced any kind of a downturn in sales tax revenue. Most of them have seen what we've seen. And I have some slides later that'll, that'll emphasize that. Some of these other revenues that uh, aren't impacted quite as much by that. Telecommunications, again, continuing to go down. That's just a downward trend type of tax. And hopefully we find some other sources of revenue to kind of start replacing that, or I'm kind of hoping that it'll at least bottom out so that it'll quit going down. Uh, it should. And some of that might take legislation or something like that, so we get Gary involved to try and rectify some of that. Um, licenses and permits, another big area that you know, over time you might expect that, hey, Leighton City might slow down on construction and we just don't see that in the licenses and permit revenue side of things. Um, charges for services in a negative position, so what we should be based on those adjustments. Any questions on the revenues, revenue side of it? Uh, this is actual to actual. This next one would be more for you to be able to review the budget to actual. So, you know, on property tax, even though the prior slide said it was up 1.7 million, we had budgeted to bring in 8.9 and we brought in 9.2. So we were really only ahead of the budget by 324,000. That's still fantastic. Sales tax, mid-year we would have anticipated being, you know, at or below budget, and we end up 330,000 ahead of budget. So that's another 
very good sign. Uh, some of these others, like I mentioned, are, are a little below budget, and we just have to keep an eye on those. We don't, we can't really control them. Some of them are, some of them are related to the weather, you know, how hot it is or how cold it is, and how much utility we, the, the residents of the city use. Um, again, licenses and permits. We talked about that compared to budget charges for services compared to budget was fine, even though actual to actual we were down. And intergovernmental, that, that's mostly because we had a fairly large grant related to Hill Air Force Base that wasn't spent by June 30th. And so that comes in under budget. It's not something to be concerned about, but we, have, we budget the grant so that we can spend it, but the project wasn't completed. So uh, those are the budget to actuals. On the expenditure side, this column here that says total under over positive numbers mean we were under budget. And so you can see that, you know, if we had a budget in these various departments throughout the city, uh, we were under budget by 2.2 million throughout the departments. This is the general fund. And so, you know, there was a lot of uh, direction given back when the pandemic first hit that, you know, we need to be very cautious, very frugal, make sure in case money needs to be turned back because we didn't know what was going to happen. And you can see that the departments responded to that and did that. Now, I do like to break it out a little bit and show what amount of that is related to wages because uh, the policy is that, you know, we budget for wages for a certain number of positions that are approved. And if those positions go vacant for a while during the year for whatever reason, turnover and so forth, we're not allowed to move that money from wages and buy a piece of equipment just because we have it, right? We don't hire somebody for a couple of months, we go out and buy a new truck. We don't do that in the city, you know, that's not allowed. And so I do like to break wages out and you can see that, you know, that made up 930,000 of it. And then we also had open purchase orders at the end of the year that made up 284,000 of it. And so I kind of like to look at it, uh, the total non-wage category of what we spent, and then I base these percentages on that. And so you can see that we were, you know, about 2.4% under budget for the year on the expenditures in the general fund. Um, this slide, as I was sitting out here in the audience, I thought, why did I put that slide in there? Because <laughs> it just is a little confusing. But what it's attempting to do here is reconcile for you where we ended up with our unassigned fund balance in the general fund. Because ultimately what we want to know is how are we doing with our reserves. I mean, we want to know all these other details, but are we healthy? You know, are we in a good position? And so from 2019 to 2020, our unassigned reserves went up 1.1 million in the general fund. And so that's a very good position to be in. We estimated originally that we would spend, I um, thought I had that number on here somewhere. Originally, we estimated that we had spent about 2.3 million in fund balance in order to balance our budget for 2020, and we ended up adding 1.1 million. And so that's a function of what I just explained where we had savings on the expenditure side and more revenues than we anticipated. Some of the enterprise funds, uh, important areas to look at, would be just how the reserves in those funds are sitting. Uh, in the water fund, that increased 4.5 million. We've gone through a couple of presentations about the fact that we were building up some funds for some very large projects that are coming up. And so we can see that number appearing here in our unassigned unre unrestricted fund balance uh, going up 4.5. Storm sewer up 1.3. That was also a fund where we had one last rate increase in order to get the rates where we need them in order to accomplish some larger projects. The sewer fund, uh, it's reserve went down 206,000, but you can see that we still have a, a very healthy reserve in the sewer fund. Refuse fund, about even. The swimming pool fund, that of course got hit with the COVID thing where we had to shut down, and yet we still had some expenses, and we had some, and we actually took advantage of some of that time of when I talked to Mr. Price of, of doing some maintenance that needed to be done while it was closed, so there was still some expenditures that happened. Um, Street lighting fund is in line with, with what we would have expected. It, even though the reserve went down a little, the reserve is, is healthy there. Emergency medical reserve. This one 
would require probably more explanation than we have time for because I don't want to take up all the time of the meeting. This, this 3.1 million number is a number that shows up in financial statements, but in reality, the emergency medical fund was affected because of the way the retirement system is handled for firefighters and EMS personnel. And if you look at the stock market and the way the market's risen, the retirement system gained huge financial assets. And those, because of the way the firefighter system is structured, end up reflecting in our financial statements. And so, in reality, this fund has about 1.9 million, I would say, as a, as a spendable reserve that we could use. The 3.1 million, I, I wouldn't use that as a number that we would say we have that much set aside. And I realize that probably deserves another half hour of explanation, but that, that's as much as I want to give you with the time we have. So the athletic fund, it was affected negatively because of the, mostly because of COVID. Uh, we had expenditures that were made and then programs were canceled. And the timing of programs that, cr that cross over the year, year end, affected that fund. And we'll most likely be coming back with a budget amendment to you to help recoup some of that money into that athletic fund out of the general fund to make them whole again. Um, our other governmental funds, budget to actual, uh, emergency dispatch, victim services, all of these were under budget and in good position. The capital projects funds appear, appear to be way under budget. We know we have 3.8 million of this 6.5 is for the fire station that's currently being designed. And then various other streets projects mostly that are just, they weren't completed as of June 30th. We're right in the middle of the construction season. Kind of an odd time for a year end for that, for that type of business. Um, before I go on to the next, just the kind of final words and moving forward, I'll turn a few minutes over to uh, Robert Wood and he can go over his audit reports briefly. Tracy, are we gonna get a copy of that hard copy? A hard copy? Yeah. If you'd like a hard copy, I can give uh, you I would share. like one. Okay. Okay, pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, under these circumstances, this is my sixth presentation and last one that I have to do, but uh, I know Tracy's talked a lot about these financial statements. There's a lot of work that goes into putting this book together, not only by he and his department, but I get to review a lot, if not most, of all of these pages to look for corrections and stuff. Because one of the benefits on your city is you do apply for a GFOA certificate of excellence in financial reporting, which I believe you've received for over 25 years. Fully expect that you're going to receive it for the 26th year in a row and whatnot as we, as we do these statements. But as the numbers Tracy just reviewed, we look at all of that. There's obviously the entity-wide statements, which you talked about up, up front, and then there's the governmental funds. And what we do is required by every organization that undergoes an audit, they're looking for that independent auditor's report. So if you were to look on pages seven through nine of this booklet, you'd find our independent auditor's report that covers what's our opinion on your governmental activities, your business type activities, each major fund, the discreetly presented component unit, which is your Metro Narcotics Task Force, that you as a city help um, do some of the accounting work and whatnot for. There's also your each major fund, governmental funds, business type funds, and then anything that's of a non-major type category that gets aggregated together. Happy to report, if you were to look at those pages, that we are giving you an unmodified opinion. So really what that states is we don't feel there's any material misstatements in any of the statements as presented within this financial statement. Also the notes that back up the financial statements and the supplemental schedules. So it's the best opinion that I as an independent auditor can give your organization. So congratulations, Merry Christmas. Uh, happy to do it. I love working with this city. They do a great job in managing the details and making sure that stuff is where it should be. As part of that audit process, we're not just looking at stuff, what's going on, what do you have in your records, but we compare that with outside organizations, your bonding companies, your cash accounts, at your various banks that you deal with. Um, we confirm stuff through uh, your BNC road money with the Utah Department of Transportation, your sales tax revenues through the Utah State Tax Commission, and other tax revenue sources that you get from Rocky Mountain Power, Comcast, Xfinity, um, 
Dominion Energy, and so forth. So we take the word of ex we take what external parties have, and we compare that against your records as we come up with these opinion and the financial statement uh, numbers. So happy to report that we've given you the best opinion we can give an organization when it comes to an independent auditor's report. He's also mentioned there's two other reports that we give. One is on internal control and on your compliance with laws, regulations, grant agreements, contracts, and so forth. That is actually found on page 144. It's a two-page report. It's really not an opinion, but it's really when we come and look at your internal control structure and we look at your compliance with laws and regulations, we had no issues with your internal control structure and how you do it over financial reporting so that you can come up with this document. Uh, so no issues there. We did have three small issues when it came to compliance and those compliance are also with the state compliance uh, audit guide that's issued by the state auditor's office. So those reports are found at the very back of your book. That would be on page 46. So some of the stuff, and I know Tracy's mentioned some of this as he went through his original presentation, you guys adopt a budget, not only in June, but you might amend that budget throughout the year, and then you come up with a final budget, and he's explained, he went through all those funds. There was not one fund that you had under budget. So happy to report that management is following the appropriation that you set for each and each individual fund. One of the items that he talked about is the general fund, the operating fund. Well, state code says that your general fund can have a fund balance that's spendable. So when they look at that, there's five categories of fund balance. The three that they're interested in because you have control over those are unassigned fund balance, assigned fund balance, and committed fund balance. You don't have any committed, which is what you would do as a legislative body. They look at those three numbers in your general fund and the fund balance, and they compare those with your operating revenues in the general fund of the current year. Now they state that needs to be between five to 25%. This is our favorite finding to give. We focus on the negative, but this to me is a negative positive because your fund balance was at 26.1%. So in other words, you have excess funding that is available. Now in reality, you've taken care of that in your fiscal year 21 budget, but that's not what the state code refers it to. So it's really saying, hey, you've got a little bit of excess fund over there by 1.1%. You can go out and fund some of these other projects that you might have. I know Mr. Jackson in the office, he's always got projects you can go out and do. Right, Steve? I get to review a lot of Steve's expenditures. One of the other aspects as we go through this is looking at fund balances for each individual fund. This was your, basically your second finding that we have reported on page 149. Two of the funds, uh, because of COVID, we've talked about one of those, the athletic program. They had some expenditures they went out and did, then this thing called COVID hit and shut down all of our rec programs and canceled a lot of the stuff and you had to give a lot of refunds back. Well, we couldn't return the merchandise that we had bought for those programs and so forth. And because those expenditures were greater than the revenues, it was also more than the fund balance that was carried over from the prior year. So that fund had a deficit fund balance of just over $77,000. The additional fund is in your governmental side. Uh, the emergency dispatch fund also was an, impacted by what happened with the COVID and so forth. And they ended up the, uh, finishing at the end of the year with a deficit fund balance of $4,911. So just barely. But these weren't noticed, so you could correct them in your final budget in June. So because they're in a deficit fund balance, those are two items that we also have to report to you. So in total, you've got three what we consider really minor findings, you can take care of those in, in fiscal year 2021. No other issues when it comes to all the other components that have to be reviewed as required by the state auditor's office. You're complying with everything you're supposed to be doing. So my pleasure to give that type of report to you as an organization that you're, I think you're doing really well. I know it's already been mentioned. Um, we met with the audit committee and we went through various things and you've got two great individuals that are part of that audit committee that have uh, significant experience in governmental and financial type reporting and whatnot. So great discussion that we had with them and answering some of the questions they might have. I'm happy to report that every time I've worked with the city, the city, you as a council and also management, very proactive. If we find anything, you don't sit on it. You address it right away and take care of the issues. 
So I expect great things from continuing to go forth as we audit each and every year. So thank you. Any questions I can answer for you as a council? We just appreciate all the time and energy you put into this and the uh, honesty in your reporting and, and the con compiling of that document there because I know yes. it's pretty big. <laughs> I will give you one heads up. One of the things, the reason we're coming a little bit later is obviously you received some, you received federal dollars. This year you've actually cracked the threshold of $750,000 of spent federal money. Well, part of that is the CARE Act money. You received a, a good chunk of money up front from the, the, the state of Utah as part of your grantor and you're a sub-recipient of them. You spent a little bit of that. We're still waiting for the guidance from the federal government. Now, the U.S. Department of Treasury has said, hey, this is how we want you to treat uh, the funding that we receive for CARES Act, which is really kind of a reimbursement, we'll pay for your public safety employees. Well, but the audit guidance hasn't come out for that yet. We've been waiting for over three months yeah. for them to answer that question. But because this report is still due by the end of this month to the state auditor's office, we've gone ahead and issued the financial audit, and then we will come back and give you the single audit report for those programs that you're on. That's gonna be like your uh, CDBG, which is a community development block grant, CARE Act money, stuff your police department received in JAG. So we will be going through a single audit. We're just kind of in the whole pattern waiting for that official guidance to come out. So we will be back. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Robert. So I'll just take a, a couple more minutes. I will compliment. Uh, Robert Wood and his firm, they do a, a very thorough job. Uh, they've gone through and, uh, you know, he and I joke a little bit about periods and commas and stuff like that. I mean, that's how detailed he reviews things. So I think you can be very, feel a lot of confidence in him and his firm doing a, a very good job. Uh, just a couple last things, take just a couple more minutes. I don't want to take the whole meeting, but sales tax review. So we can see that um, last year, June 30th, ended much better than we'd anticipated. And, you know, in these sales tax figures that we looked at, if we looked at actual to actual, 826, budget to actual, 330, we're up to about 2% uh, for the year over budget, 5.8% actual to actual, or 5.1, sorry, 5.18. And so, uh, great position sales tax wise to be in. That was one of our major concerns when we adopted the budget in June and we actually put a number of things on hold uh, and we mentioned that we would come back and discuss that with you prior to January 1st so that we could make a determination if we could move forward with those uh, items that were on hold until January. Some of those things have already been taken off hold based on discussions with Mr. Jensen and the council. And so as we look at the first three months of this year, where, where are we at? Um, so far this year, actual to actual, we're already up $692,000. I mean, if you looked at last year, we were only up 826 on the whole year. And in the first three months, and particularly September, and I went back through the details on this, I thought there must be an error, right? I mean, $420,000 year over year increase in September, that's, that's phenomenal. And, uh, went back through and it just falls right in line with categories. There's just categorical increases in a lot of those that we've talked about, you know, the home improvements and, uh, and vehicle sales and things like that. So uh, it's, it's uh, hopefully I don't have to come back and the state says they made some kind of mistake, right? <laughs> but, but as far as I can tell from the details of this, it looks, you know, like a valid number. And so if we compare that to what we had budgeted for 2021, uh, you know, right now, 776000 ahead of schedule. Uh, that puts us in a very good position uh, so far this year. I mean, we could go the rest of the year at break even and be ahead, way ahead. And, and I don't see that happening. You know, I'm, of course, October, November, December, those seem to be trending the same ways, even though I don't have the numbers. But just from the activity around, you can see what's happening in the community and so forth. Anyway, based on these numbers, the, the financial report, the good standing of the city, the position of sales tax, the uh, property taxes that have been collected that I discussed, it'd be my recommendation that uh, the council consider moving forward with the items that were frozen, you know, so that Jan you know, effective January when everybody gets back from the breaks, you know, holidays and stuff, then 
the various departments can move forward with those things that are put on hold. Um, as far as this whole presentation, I don't know if anybody has any questions, and obviously I'm open for questions anytime. Uh, you can give, my, give me a call. Just on that September number, um, Tracy, was there anything specific? Was it cars or just everything was up? Um, you know, mostly, I mean, pretty much across the board. You did still have uh, down in a lot of the hospitality type areas and uh, your restaurants weren't quite as high as they have been in the past just because of, you know, limited compared to prior years, but not saying that they weren't doing, you know, reasonable. Um, September is kind of a larger month because it's a quarterly reporting period. And so you get a lot of the smaller businesses that only have to report once a quarter. Now that's expected. And so, you know, th this kind of a, an increase from one year to the next not, is not expected though, just because of that quarterly reporting. But I would say across most all categories, it was, it was So even, uh, even the restaurants and the hotels were as good as last year? Yeah, let me grab a paper I have. I thought the hotels were down? down quite a bit. I would think they would be. Yeah, they were. They got hit the hardest, from what I understand. I, I'm just curious how they're hanging on and stuff. How well, one thing that we did have as well, uh, September was the first big month for RC Willie, so they build up July, August, and then September was their, you know, their biggest month. Now, obviously, in a public meeting, I can't disclose the numbers, but it's a good number for us. The other thing that's uh, taking on a much larger role all the time is the uh, online sales. You know, so a few, couple of years ago, they started requiring online sales to collect sales tax, and that's that's actually our fourth largest contributor now is online sales. So that's that's huge, that's right? If you really think about what our traditional contributors to sales tax would be, and this is now taking the fourth spot. And only going up. I had a paper here somewhere that talked about that. I apologize, Mr. Day. That I, I, I'm just curious, is all. I can send it over to you. I'm just curious how they're hanging on and how they're doing. Is 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 the reason my question? Okay, and also I have the summary that I can put together and and send it over to you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I do have one, being that this is my first year doing this. Um, when we get to the consent, are we are we approving the the financial report, the auditor's report, or are we accepting the whole budget final or whatever? Basically, what you're doing is accepting this comprehensive annual financial report for review. Okay. So maybe I didn't make that in my. Well, I, my only concern was is I haven't seen it until tonight. It got sent to us late this yeah. afternoon, and I haven't had a chance to even open it up. And so to try okay. to approve something that I haven't seen. Right. So I you're not approving it or bit. adopting it. It's not a budget. You're just accepting it. That it here it is, and I'm now going to review okay. it. Okay. And if you have questions about it, then you can contact me with questions okay. about it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. And if I can give you any type of comfort I will say that uh, the two gentlemen that we have on our audit committee they did receive it in advance and they went through with uh, with the fine tooth comb so I think you can rest assured there now punctuation I'm not going to go there because I know how good you are but I trust these guys if, they, if Robert was questioning it <laughs> maybe this is just general and if you don't know it's fine uh, just on uh, page 128 it talks about kind of the rank of sales tax payers, where where was where do you foresee RC Wheelies being in that kind of list of of companies as Walmart at number one, been number one for a decade? Yeah, so there's your top three and our oh where would RC Wheelie yeah. be? Sorry, number four obviously shows Amazon in there. Um, well, we only have one good month, right? So far, so. I mean, if you were to take that out, you'd, they'd fall up in the top five. Okay. Great. Yeah. As you, as we go along with the sales tax and as we approve, which we have approved the budget, will be made notice 
like what you've put up, taken from the budget and done. Does that make sense? You mean any adjustments? No, not adjustments. Like we put things on hold. Oh. So if you say I'm going to hire the two police officers or the, some trucks or whatever, will be made known. This is what we're doing. Does that make sense? I think I, I think what you're asking for is a, a list of the items that we have yet to uh, to release mm -hmm. to be acted upon. Yeah. Is yeah. that what you're asking for? I don't know if I'm asking for a list. Just I guess what I, let what us I, know what we've done with the budget as we mm -hmm. continue down the road. Right. So my recommendation would be that we take the budget as we adopted originally without things on hold. And at this point, I feel we're in a good enough financial position that we can now unfreeze all of those items. Right. And I would imagine Mr. Jensen will talk with the mayor and, and council and, you know, if if you feel like we need to present what was frozen, I guess that's your question. As far as what would we be unfreezing, we could do that. Well, or we could mail out, we could email out the presentation that kind of listed, here's what it was. Um, anyway. Tracy, one of the bills that they talked about this week in the league meeting is increasing, possibly increasing the rainy day fund of the reserve balances from 25% to 35% for cities. Okay. Just FYI, it's maybe helpful in the future for the cities with, with not knowing with emergencies happening, pandemic, and we seem to be just fine, but there may right. be some flexibility in the future. Yeah, it would. Um, in my opinion, we've been keeping ours in the time that I've been here, and even before that, we've had a target of around 15%. It isn't set in policy or anything, but that's just kind of what we've targeted, and we've managed to get ourselves into the position we're in right now, which is a 26% reserve, right? So uh, Layton is diverse enough in economy and in demographic and in housing opportunities I mean, it's just such a great mix to help generate revenue to support the city, in my opinion. So, um, yeah. So it's typically municipalities that have less diverse economies that want to have a higher sales savings basis so that if something happened to Park City or something with of course. huge... Moab. Okay. Right? Dec decimated because tourism. I mean, I like I indicated, our hotels and restaurants are the ones that are down when everything else is up. Well, that's all they have. Right. So, you know, that, that kind of destroys a place like that. I shouldn't say that they're destroyed. I mean, they're not, but, you know, if we were, if we were very specific like that, then it's much more concerning. We can see what happened here in ours. Well, this went down, this went up. That's not always gonna be the case. In the 08, 09, recession, everything went down, right? So, but that was across the board, across everyone. Yeah. Ready to move on? No? Marshall, I, I just to clear up um, about unfreezing the things that were frozen. About what, sorry? About unfreezing the things that we froze. Yeah. So with numbers like this, I, I can't see any reason to have to go into a lot of discussion on that. Right. I mean, I would imagine that Mr. Jensen would just approach the mayor and say, are we good to go? You know, and she would discuss that with the council. And we didn't, we didn't have it in our mind to do a formal presentation. I guess if that's what you wanted, then. I, I guess that's where my misunderstanding with the conversation here was if there was gonna be, I don't see the need for one. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll look for nods from you guys now so I know how to act when uh, I sit down with you. You're good with it. Well, I think the suggestion that you made maybe just sending out again what you put on hold if we needed a refresher I don't think we need to you know really have a whole yeah we're going to take all of this off I personally don't have a problem with it but you know Dave might want the list of what we you know what's still coming I I don't know I'm I'm okay like Tom is so okay. just just send it out again okay. yeah. I don't care to have anything formal just let us know as it goes, what's going out. So, okay. you know, just knowledge. Okay. Council, because I know that that means a lot for uh, the operation of the city and making sure that we continue to 
provide for our citizens as well. So, okay, okay. ready to move on now? Yep, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Trace. Okay, we'll move on to item number four, which is a rezone request, and Mr. Chad Wilkinson will give us the details there. Thank you, Mayor, Council. This is really just an update on uh, the steps that have been taken since the last time we met on this item. So I'll go really quickly through kind of the process that we've that we've gone through since we last met on this item. Uh, the council had directed staff to look at um, a variety of things, but really focused on M M1, M2 uses, whether we thought some of those uses could still be or could be added to our list of uses for the CP1 zone and whether or not M1 um, was an, a, another option that could be looked at for this property. I, I will mention that the, the application is very specific. It's a request to go to our M2 zone. Uh, it's our heavy industrial zone. So. You know, th this was more of an exercise of looking at where, where are there some other options available, and which we did. Um, we spent after the last meeting, Tim and I, Tim Watkins and I, sat down and looked at the uses, and. I wanted to mention, we probably didn't do as good of a job as we could of communicating this at our last meeting, but part of that last CP1 amendment that you just approved a few weeks ago was to look at just that, to see if there were uses that were in our industrial zone that would be appropriate to bring into our CP1 zone. This, this little table that we have here is a list of those uses that are allowed in the CP1. Um, there's a variety of uses. Interestingly enough, those uses that you can see on your screen that are grayed out, they kind of have the gray um, color there, uh, those are uses that are allowed in all three of those zones, M1, M2, uh, and CP1, um, just per those changes you recently made. So we did find that you know, a lot of the uses are across the board anyway. Um, those uses, though, that we had proposed to you in the last amendment were really the uses that we had already determined that could be um, added and that, that could be um, additional flexible uses for that CP1 zone. So you'll, you'll see things like the light commercial flex manufacturing. That was one we talked about quite a bit during that amendment. Uh, the e-commerce, the e retail and fulfillment, those are uses that, again, they have elements of those industrial um, zones, but they're, they're light enough that they don't have huge impacts on adjacent properties, so we felt that those were appropriate to be added. So once we did that analysis, the, the yellow and the green mean something too. I'll just explain what that means real quick. The green are, are uses that, that uh, well, maybe I'll get to the green. The yellow are uses that we, uh, we sp focused in on in that last amendment that were added as part of that last amendment. Um, the green has to do with the next step. That Once we'd taken a look at those uses and determined that there really weren't a lot of additional uses that we would feel comfortable in adding because the other uses really are the heavier industrial uses. Once we'd done that, we did schedule a meeting with the applicant to, to discuss what we'd, we'd found. As part of that, you know, we, felt we did focus our efforts on kind of explaining some of these new uses that were now available to the applicant um, as part of that CP1 amendment to explain some of those additional options that were available. Uh, we, did, we did have that meeting, we explained those. Um, Based on that meeting, we, we didn't feel that there was really any kind of uh, consensus on, on that being what the direction that, that the applicant would like to go forward with. Had some additional conversations about the, the current zone change application and, and uh, you know, our comfort with, or I guess our discomfort with those uses that are, are heavier industrial uses and that we, we still were not willing to to bring those uses to you, or to bring that zone to you as a recommendation for approval because of our concern with those uses. So that's really, in a nutshell, where we're at. We also, one thing I'd mention is we had a, a large amount of public interest in this item since the last meeting. We had several of the neighboring or potential neighboring properties, property owners reach out to us uh, about, specifically about the timing of, of this decision. They were very concerned about, um, you know, what what the timing would be for this decision to be made so that they could um, make their own decisions related to, to property. And so we did feel that because of that strong public interest, we wanted to get this back before the council uh, as soon as we could so that you could um, make your, your decision as, as far as how to move forward. With that, that's an update. Happy to answer any questions if I can. We're st our recommendation would still remain unchanged for the proposal for the uh, M2 zoning. Would still be a, a recommendation of denial based on uh, the the zoning not complying with the general plan. And uh, again, the planning commission review this and have that same recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Council, you feel like you need to ask any questions now or good to wait until the next Chad, meeting? can you just scroll this list down a little further? Yeah. 
Tell me when. Just I just kind of scanning through them as you go. Oh sure, yeah, I'd be happy to yeah do it slower than I did. One thing that we found again was that many of these uses were already allowed across the board on all three of those zones, um, which was a bit of a revelation to us. But we, what wasn't a surprise to us is that we'd, we'd already done that analysis of the types of uses that could be brought over from the industrial zones to the CP1, and that was part of that uh, recommendation a few weeks ago. Okay. We good. All right, well, let's go ahead, uh, knowing that we have a few more items here on our agenda, let's go ahead and move on to the next item, which, Chad, I know you're going to present on that, so go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. The, the next item is a kind of the culmination of, of several months of work. You'll remember about a year ago, a little bit less than a year ago, we had a group of citizens that, that came to your meeting and had some concerns. Uh, they were good concerns that uh, we uh, looked into as a city. Uh, they were related to some of the development um, that had gone on. Um, let me see, I always forget which, which window that is. There we go. Some of the developments that have, have occurred, especially in some of our slope areas, uh, one of those was the, the cottages of Valley View, another, we had some issues that came up that didn't really come before the council too much, but came before staff, kind of in that same vein on uh, vistas at Eastgate, and some of those same issues that, that came up there related to grading and drainage and how those standards work together. The results of that uh, conversation we had at council was that staff, as you know, went and met with individual property owners in, in one of those developments, spent a couple of months meeting individually, coming up with a list of items uh, that were code related, that, that needed to be addressed with, with that development. And as part of that process, we identified standards that, that did need to be looked at for some revision. We, we found that there were some things that we needed to look at in our code that would increase our ability to coordinate between the departments, um, that would needed clarification, things that were obsolete, that no longer were being implemented in the city because they just weren't the best practices and that they were considered to be obsolete. So we did go through that. It was a, a multiple month long process. There was a committee that was made up of, of city staff that looked at those in a comprehensive manner. We looked at the three titles of the code that relate to building and development. That's title 15, which guides our building and construction. You could call that the building code chapter. Title 18 is really our subdivision and development chapter and title 19, which covers the zoning uh, side of those things. So the effort was to coordinate those three codes to make sure that we have similar terminology, uh, clarify roles of, of re and responsibilities related to inspection and to uh, plan review and those types of things, make some clarifications on terminology and uh, delete some things that were obsolete and add some things that would add clarification to the ordinance. So this ordinance before you tonight is a culmination of those efforts. I wanted to point out one thing that we, we had a good discussion on our planning commission about one item that's very important to understand, and that is that, you know, we do have some things that, that we are uh, recommending be removed from some of those codes, but it's very important to know that, that we're, we're not without development standards. We have a separate um, group of development guidelines and design standards that are adopted. You can see that in this, uh, this is a resource that's available on our website. You can see that those range from um, street improvements, uh, sanitary sewer system, stormwater, land land drain, a, a variety of, of design and development standards are included in that. If we click on each of those down arrows, you'll see that each of those has their own subcategories and it gets into a, a good amount of detail on those on those standards. So this is really an effort even to coordinate with those standards and make sure that our code and these development guidelines and design standards that are adopted are consistent with each other. So with that, I, I want to just hit on just a, a very few things that I'm going to let the remainder of any time that you need to, to ask any questions you have, but uh, our, our Title 15 was amended to, again, provide clarity on plan review and responsibilities. Um, these are predominantly clarification. We, we would term them as, as cleanup items in some ways, um, but there are a few places where we did recommend that some standards that have been in place um, be removed because of their being obsolete, um, be not re reflecting current standards and practices. And again, there's no there's no concern about those there being a vacuum filled by deleting those because there's standards already in place that, that are already being implemented currently that uh, that address these very issues. I'm going to go quickly. That's why I, I am going very quickly, but I, I promise that if you have questions, we're happy. Uh, our city engineer, Steve Jackson, is here tonight. The both of us are happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. One other item I wanted to hit on, the predominant section that we changed was 
or title that we changed was Title 18. As you scroll through those changes, you'll see that, again, those are predominantly uh, clarification, updates to definitions, cleanups. One thing I wanted to go, go to in Title 19, we really just got into our sensitive lands ordinance in Title 19. I'm going to go there very quickly, and I try not to make you sick by going through too quickly through those definitions. But we defined the average slope and how we calculate that average slope. This will allow us to have additional clarity um, on how we would you know, tell some how you calculate average slope for the purposes of applying those uh, sensitive lands ordinance standards. So with that, uh, I know that was a lot. Uh, it's a, it's a, a long, it's, it's a number of titles that are being affected, but again, most of those changes, in fact, as I went through them today, I, again, I, I, I really can say these are mostly cleanup and clarification items, but we're happy to answer any questions you may have. I want to give one other just preview of coming attractions, and that is that we have plans in the next few months. We've started the process to uh, comprehensively uh, amend our sensitive lands ordinance to address some of the other things that came up during this review over the last year. Uh, that's We've started that process. We've got a committee that's meeting um, that's going to come back with some recommendations for some changes to that ordinance, as well as some of our, our private um, subdivision and private street development standards that we'll be bringing to you in the future. So with that, I promise that's the end, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Council, you have any questions here? I can save it till the other meeting. What was it? What was that? I'm sorry. I can Tom? save it till the other meeting. Okay. 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 All right. Well, good. Thank you, Chad. We appreciate Thank you, Mayor. that presentation. We'll take some action on the next meeting. Okay. So now we have time for our presentation regarding the water rate analysis and the master plan review. So, Mr. Tracy and Steve Jackson is going to come yeah, up. So, unfortunately, we're running a little short because I was yeah. probably long-winded on the other one. But what we came down to in our last presentation was a recommendation that we, based on all of our analysis, uh, continue forward with the plan and have a 10% increase in the water rates. Um, tonight, we just like to, I think there were some questions that weren't answered, so we'll just that's where we stood on it as a management recommendation. So if you have questions, we're here to address those. Some of you guys had some questions. Um, I, ha I have more of a comment than a question. Um, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to the 10% increase, but uh, I'm hesitant to approve that 10% increase until after your presentation last time and other times in the past, it's obvious that a lot of these new projects are gonna be secondary from the near future on. And so until those secondary systems are decided how they're gonna function, what part's gonna be individual irrigation company, what part's gonna be city, and those contracts and things are done, I have a hesitancy to uh, pass that additional fund uh, funding. So I think it's imperative in the next month or two that we uh, decide those things. I, I, I agree. I, that was one of my questions is, can we provide services? The city does culinary water. Obviously everybody needs culinary water. Secondary water is, well, secondary. And I, I know we, well, I don't know. That's why we're asking questions, but how we, how we buy that secondary water, who we buy that from, and do they, it's a lot of money and infrastructure. Are they part of that? Do they pay for part of that? How, how does all of that work? And so those are questions that I would, I'd love to have a secondary water deep dive meeting. Okay, yeah, I, 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 I can understand the question I think is that, that we're going to spend money on the secondary projects that are slated into the, into the future. Um, the, I guess the short answer to you, uh, Councilman Morris, is that um, the, the system, if, if the city takes over the system, then the system is paid for by the users of that system. And, and so the majority of the new secondary water uh, projects are, are actually for the new growth areas that we're experiencing in the city. And that's why they're, they're programmed, as you, as you saw on the maps, on that west side of town where, where it's new growth, where it's, it's new construction. So those projects would be paid for from, uh, say, impact fees, and, and then the user fees would pay for the, the maintenance and operation of that system into the future. 
Um, and, and as far as the, the, the contracts and what we're working on there, we, we've met with Alex and we're, we're working through those uh, items to, to hopefully bring that back to you shortly. I know Gary had mentioned that we had a, a kind of draft agreement. We're trying to make sure that that's solid and, and in place so that when we do present that, all of those items are addressed um, in that, that same yeah, uh, vein, I guess, of, of making sure that we're doing what's right by the city. Um, and, and then to, to further discuss that item, the, the, um, we, we do have a plan that we would spend money on those secondary projects because we anticipated that those would be coming to the forefront. There are other culinary projects that can be completed if, if the secondary ones do not come to fruition. It's not like we're, we're just sitting here saying, hey, we're going to wait and wait and wait. There are multiple projects on the list that, that can be moved around, not necessarily you know, huge swings, but, but there is a need for that funding. Also, the, the funding for the, the maintenance and upkeep of the system is always important. Um, that's, that's a big uh, component of this, and, and the list we went through was just simply the projects, the new projects, basically, but there is replacement that needs to continue to happen, and there is other, you know, places we need to find the money. It's just finding the balance to, to make those happen, so... Um, when we, when the prior councils passed the three tiered or the three annual increases, they were taken as a whole, right? It wasn't, there wasn't a, this is not a rhetorical question, but there wasn't a discussion of we'll just do the first two years. That was our idea to, to cut off the third year and think about it. Is that right? Well, right. What we, what I had proposed and when I talked to Mr. Jensen as well was we should review each year more or less to make sure the model was in line, right? Because it's a model and, you know, models don't always reflect, reflect reality. But the, the recommendation was, okay, let's do 65% increase the first year. No, no, we're not going to do that. Well, and let's do 35, 20, 10. I mean, there was probably 10 iterations of how should we do this thing, you know? And what we came up with being the most feasible for the consumers and the most capable of accomplishing what we need to on the system side was the 35 20 10. Um, obviously 35 and 20 were the most critical pieces because time value of money and everything if you don't get it going up front you're going to be way behind but yes it was okay because that that was my i went that was my hesitancy with the 10 percent um even after the discussion with the this we still need this money for these projects because it would seem to me if you're making a decisions on what projects are going to come to the forefront and you are understanding that the you're on this three-step track that you're obviously going to find enough projects to to pay for the 35 the 20 and the 10. so if we've implemented the 35 and the 20 and now we're saying, yeah, you know, actually we do need this last 10% because we still have these projects that we want to pay for. Well, of course, you're going to have projects to pay for in that regard because you you had a three-year window of, of revenue or a ta tax increase or fee increase that we're going to pay for these specific projects. And so I guess my, my concern is, is, is the 10% necessary because it's necessary or is it necessary just because that's what the plan was originally that we were going to have these this three-tiered raise and these are the projects that we're going to to put together well i could probably let mr jackson answer that my brief answer would be it was a master plan a 10-year plan right and we can only go out 10 years in so, for some things and so it's a it's a long-term plan and this these rate increases were set to accomplish the long-term plan not just, you know, well, we have the money, so let's go ahead and do these things. No, it's a long-term system health and system uh, conservation plan, right? And, and one thing I could maybe add to what, what Tracy's saying is that when we talked about the iterations, we went through a lot of iterations. We tried to move projects to where we could to make this as palatable as possible and not really 
um, you know, just really heavy on that front end, but we also had to look at the recommended funding for the maintenance of the system, the operation of the system. So every year we we have to go through and make sure we're meeting all of the federal regulations, all of the state regulations. We have the ISO audit with the fire department. Um, we have the highest rating we can possibly get with the fire department, which keeps everybody else's insurance rates low. And I, I don't know what the quantitative value of that is, but, but those things all cost money to make sure we have a, a well-functioning, well-run system. And, and one of the things we had to do in order to bring the number down was to cut what was the recommended amount. I believe it's $3 million a year that they recommend just on our system value we should be spending on maintenance and replacement of our system. And we had to bring that really far down to, to just under or just over a million dollars in order to make sure that we're we're, we're not trying to just be way out there in those funding numbers. So I would say it's not just the projects that we're, we're trying to fund, it's also the replacement and the maintenance of the system. I, I, I think our system's in good shape, but it's also aging and, and some of our lines are getting to be in that 50, 60 year range where uh, obviously we're celebrating our centennial. I, I hope we don't have any 100 year old pipe anymore, but <laughs> the, there are aging systems out there. Replacement is starting to become more of the, the norm instead of maybe building new. And so I, I think if you want to look at it from that perspective, there could always be uh, you know, the maintenance number that we had to, to cut down is is right on the edge, in my opinion, of where we really should be to, to have that buffer, so. Yeah, I, I guess it, it, we have a financial accounting report that says we have 26% savings mm -hmm. balance, and someone, some member of the community sees that, and then they say, well, why are they raising this 10% if they, they have well more than what they need in their reserve balances? Why are they passing it on to the, to the citizens? who've already had to suffer a 55% increase in their water water rates over the last two years. So I, I think that I, I'm, I'm definitely on board with we want to make sure the system is funded. So I don't think it's really a matter of whether we're going to fund it or not. I just, I'm curious if there are other alternative ways that do not include the 10% increase about ways we can potentially do, you know, kind of ways that we can get to where we need to be um, without passing the passing the the increase on to the to the people, that's just kind of my my thoughts on it. And I, I still, I did we as far as secondary water availability, not everyone is going to be it's not going to be available to everybody in the city. Secondary water at the end of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, uh, you're correct. And so we'll have members of the community paying. In, in some way for other members of the community for their secondary water. Uh, I know we have different tiers if you have secondary or if you don't. I get that part of it, but still, we're paying for infrastructure and some of that money is going to, would be going to secondary water infrastructure. Just wondering the demand for secondary water infrastructure. Just, is it just because it's a good idea? We might, you know, we'd be able to market the, those, that new growth with, hey, secondary water is available. Uh, what it, what went behind that? What's the what's the demand for secondary water? So so the the premise of the entire master plan was to utilize the water resources that we have available to Layton City in the most optimized way. And and one of those situations is that Weber Basin is the the wholesale supplier of water in this area, and that Layton City has our own wells. But in order to meet the demands into the future we have to come up with new source. Previous to the master plan that was adopted, we had a, a sentence in the master plan that said, go buy 8,000 acre feet of water from Weber Basin. To do that at the prices that they're projecting would require an entirely new treatment plant be, be built and run the water down from what they're calling the Bear River Pipeline and other things like that. So the cost of, of providing outdoor water to uh, citizens and residents in this area would just be astronomical for the prices that we're we're paying currently versus what they're going to sell water in the future and where we have three reservoirs I don't know of any other city in the in the state or in this region that has three reservoirs sitting on the east side of town that can provide that water and and then without fail every time we get somebody who calls because they're buying a house in Layton they say is there secondary water 
there's there's a little bit of a misconception out there that secondary water is super cheap compared to culinary water, but our rates are actually fairly comparable if you're using it the way you're supposed to and, and you're being reasonable with it that you're you're not paying that much additional or, or sometimes you're actually saving water money from being on our culinary system based on which you know system you're in so uh, i guess the answer is yes people want secondary water but it also allows us to optimize the system it, it allows us to reduce some of the really big capital projects in the culinary side by building some of these projects in the secondary side and and overall the the plan showed that we would save money in the long run by, by implementing the system and, and lowering some of those costs on the system because we're building, if, if you build an all culinary system, you have to build for the peak demand in the summer and then you only use it for a part of the year and so you're overbuilding the culinary simply to try and, and make up for the lack of that outdoor secondary water. Does that no, yeah, answer it's, some it's, questions? It's, it's it's an answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, no, it's not. And I under, and I get that the part there that that last part you mentioned the infrastructure being the during the summer months and having to be able to take care of that. I understand that. Yeah. It it is my again my my thought is that we'll have citizens that will be paying for infrastructure that they they won't see they won't they won't see that secondary water and. I think part of the answer to that is that if they if we don't do the combined plan though they would be paying for it anyway because the culinary side would have to be substantially bigger. They'd actually be paying more. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea behind, you can't really look at, well, haves and have nots, right? Um, it's more of a system, an entire system, and this was structured this way to get the, the lowest cost possible for the citizens and utilizing, optimizing the water, like you said. So if you were to eliminate the secondary out of this, you could have designed the plan that way Right, but it would cost much more to oversize the culinary system, and to purchase the water that, and is, the purchase of the water, uh, yeah, that would so have to come Steve, from. Steve, can Basin. I ask you one quick question? And no. eventually, you'd have water running to the lake, yeah. unutilized. Yeah, I thought it'd be pressurized. Okay, so yeah. back to the agreement. I know you said Gary's working on that, and. Uh, this council's new, so they wouldn't really realize some of the conversations we had prior to that as far as um, kind of forming a cooperative agreement between the different entities that can supply the secondary water. Is that agreement bringing those together, or is it just a singular one? I mean, what, uh, kind of so, give us an update there. So currently we have a, an agreement with Weber Basin Water Conservancy District and we are simply an operator of their system. We don't own the infrastructure, we just operate it and they pay us a yearly fee to do that. Uh, the difference between that and what we're working out right now, Case Creek has been the one that has kind of taken the, the first steps to, to transfer their system. The, the difference is, is that this agreement we're proposing to, to enter into with them would be that the city would then own and operate their um, their pipelines, their facilities, but they would retain ownership of the reservoirs for the time being until the the system basically becomes an entirely pressurized system. So that is currently the plan, and, and once we've, we've worked on that one, we're so far down the road, we think that, that it's imperative we get that one taken care of, then we want to move on to the, the agreement with Davis Weaver Canal and Holmes Creek Irrigation. Um, to, to be able to have similar agreements with them in order to bring the whole system together, the whole plan together as one um, kind of latent city water system, both culinary and secondary, if that makes sense. Okay. Did that confuse you even more? <laughs> No, but it, it, it brings a, an additional question, and, and I have a hesitation to say move forward with this now. Um, as far as the rate increase, putting it back on the on the the list is, I would rather wait to see what happens to that, and I'd like to know the stability of the infrastructure, and if there's going to be any additional charges to that system when the city, if and when the city takes it over, that needs to be budgeted for. I I watch that system have breaks a lot, um, and and I I wouldn't feel comfortable saying, yeah, let's go ahead and raise it. My my fellow council members you know, are probably going to shoot me for this, but I kind of question whether or not 10% is enough. If we're going to take over a system that's maybe got some issues, have we budgeted enough? I, I met with Alex earlier today. I think there's a huge portion of this whole plan that's been left out, and that is true conservation issues. And he said he would talk to you about that later, about mm -hmm. 
do we look at you know incentive programs or better education programs or something to get the conservation measure out there it's going to take dollars to do that and that's not anywhere in this plan so i personally would rather wait a little bit more and see are we really covering our bases and, are, and do we really truly know if we do take a system over what the impact of that system is going to do to the the city so that's just kind of my thoughts and and i would say that we did look at that and then there is a component tracy can speak to where where we went back and forth and we said what is going to be the amount we need to maintain and operate a secondary system as a city and and so those were taken into account what is the replacement cost of that system if it starts to to need replacement so those are all items that are built into that um in, into this financial analysis that was completed and and i I can agree with you. The conservation part of it is important. We work closely with Weaver Basin to, to, you know, kind of piggyback on what they're doing. They've just built a beautiful new facility up there for conservation. They haven't got to use it fully because of COVID and things like that. And, um, you know, but but we're working on secondary meters for all new connections. And there's there's other legislation being talked about for secondary metering in the in the future for existing connections. Um, and, and we are working towards a, a similar water report like uh, Weber Basin provides every month for their, or their residents that are using secondary for us as an internal system. We want to try and help promote that conservation by letting people know, educating them, hey, this is what you're using, this is what you really need to be using. Um, and then we're working with, with Chad and his group on a, on a, a an ordinance amendment or ordinance revision look at our landscaping ordinance to see is there things we can do to help i think you mentioned park strips and other things where where can we kind of help encourage maybe some more conservation simply by the design of the landscapes that we're putting in so as we conserve water is this kind of a catch-22 i mean we're going down hopefully with people using water but yet we need to create infrastructure that's going to cost more money so we have less money. That's that's built into the rate structure, right? A certain, right. Amount okay. of, a certain amount of conservation is built in there that you assume if you go to a tiered structure and raise the rates, then people are going to conserve more and that that's built into that model. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Well, we have one minute till our next meeting is supposed to start. You guys, it's good with this for now. Okay. Well, thank you, gentlemen, okay. for, thank you. for that discussion and uh, helping us understand it. Okay, I guess we have time just to stand up and uh, stretch for a minute before we get start our next meeting. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. Kim, are you ready? Bill, you're good? Okay. Just give the folks a minute to sit down here. Okay. I'd like to welcome everyone out to our city council meeting for December 17th, 2020. The time is 7.01. And uh, we'd like to uh, open our meeting as as we have done in the past, and tonight, uh, Council Member Zach Bloxham is going to lead us in the pledge and the prayer. Can all rise with me? Repeat the pledge. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to meet together as a legislative body and citizens staff of Layton City. We're grateful to live in a country in which we are free to choose our leaders and free to discuss these issues amongst ourselves. We're grateful for all the many blessings that thou hast provided to us. Please give us thy spirit as we discuss the issues on the agenda today that we may do so in a civil manner and that we may be guided to make the decisions that would be proper and just for the city as a whole. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Bloxham. Okay, Council, we have two sets of minutes that we need to approve, so I'll look for a motion on uh, on those items. Before we make the motion, and this might have been my mistake, um, Kim, but on page, on the first page of um, the September 17th, 2020 meeting, the work meeting, um, it it's like the third paragraph from the bottom. It talks about... Um, with our con communities that cares that we are working with Davis Behavioral. The word health was list left off. And I think for clarity, maybe if somebody were to read the messages minutes later that either I didn't what say What page it. was that on? I have it down on the first page of okay. of the minutes. I can, I, I can show you after, but I, just maybe adding the word health after Davis Behavioral, because that's officially their whole title is Davis Behavioral Health. And it, like I said, it may have been my fault that I didn't say that earlier, so. Thank you. Is there any other changes that anybody acknowledge? Okay, very good. Then I will look for a motion to accept the minutes. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we accept the minutes for the Layton City Council work meeting September 17th. Clamp. And the minutes from the Layton City Council meeting, oh, excuse me, the first one was the work meeting for September 17th. And then item B, which is the minutes for the Layton City Council meeting, November 19th, 2020. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you very much. That passes unanimous. We'll move on to item number two, which is our municipal announcements. I don't believe we really have any at this point, other than our lights. <laughs> Hopefully you've had an opportunity to visit those. Do you want to talk about the 12 lights of Christmas and where you, we can find those? Sure, you can. Or do you want me to? You can. Okay. <laughs> I was, okay, so those of you that uh, um, are Facebook followers and um, just as kind of a, a, a way for the for myself and the council members to kind of help spread some of the Christmas cheer around the city, we thought it would be great this year to acknowledge uh, some of the homes that have been, uh, that have kind of gone beyond that extra step in, in putting up their Christmas lights. So in doing so, we're calling it the 12 lights of Christmas. So each day, as a countdown to Christmas, we're highlighting a different home. And uh, the, we're just, it's a very rough video, but it's very sincere. And um, it's on the uh, YouTube, or I mean, excuse me, on the, uh, it's on my mayor page. It's also on a lot of the council members' uh, Facebook pages and I think the city Facebook page. So it's, it's kind of a, just a fun way to kind of um, acknowledge our citizens as well as maybe hear their Christmas message this year as well, along with acknowledgement of our centennial. So um, again, that's just an event we are trying to acknowledge this year so anyway it's it's kind of fun to watch and it's and it was certainly rewarding for us okay we'll go on to uh, item number three we do not have any verbal petitions to present at this time so i'll go ahead and move on to item number four which is our citizens comment portion uh, you're welcome to come up to, s to either podium if you have a uh, comment you'd like to make on an item that is not on the agenda. So uh, we'd welcome you at this time. And okay. Seeing that there's no city citizens comment right now, we'll go ahead and move on to our consent items. 
We only have one consent item to present tonight, so with that, we'll have um, our finance director, Mr. Tracy Probert, present to us the comprehensive annual financial report. Mayor, members of the council, pleasure to meet with you tonight. I'm here with uh, the independent auditor, uh, Robert Wood. He's the partner in the firm HBME, which as a council you've hired to perform the annual independent audit. By state statute, we're required to have an independent audit by a certified public accounting firm. And, uh, and that, that audit has been performed. Uh, the opinion of the auditors is in the comprehensive annual financial report, and I'll turn some time over to the auditors here in a second to discuss that with you. Uh, the position of the city based on our June 30, 2020 year end is in a very good position. We were able to add reserves to our general fund and many of our enterprise funds, uh, most in a planned manner. The general fund was pleasantly surprising uh, considering where we were maybe in uh, March and April. We ended the year strong and continue so into the current year. Uh, I'll turn a few minutes over to Mr. Wood so he can discuss the audit reports. Council, pleasure to be with you tonight. I appreciate all the efforts that the CUS management and also council do in managing the financial affairs of the city. Happy to report as we've gone over the numbers previously, just a quick highlight on the three reports that our office issues. The first one is the independent auditor's report, which you can find on pages seven through nine of your city's CAFR. We have given you the best opinion as we as independent auditors can give, which is an unmodified opinion. In essence, we did not find any material misstatements uh, within your financial statements or don't feel there's any that have been left over. Uh, we did make some adjustment to the financial statements, but feel they're fairly presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles in the United States of America. The second report is start, begins on page 144. It's a report on your internal control over financial reporting and also on your compliance with laws, regulations, contracts, agreements, and so forth. Happy to report that we didn't find any weaknesses in your weaknesses or significant deficiencies in your internal control over financial reporting over your mainstreams. As far as it comes to compliance, we did find one issue. Actually, there's three issues in reference to state compliance. Two of them are the same in two different funds where you had a deficit fund balance in two different funds, one governmental and one proprietary. And the, uh, the governmental fund was the emergency dispatch fund. And then the proprietary fund, enterprise fund, was your athletic program fund. Both of those really were impacted by COVID still had greater expenses than they had revenues, which caused them to receive deficits this year. The final issue that we had is with, in reference to your state compliance report, which a report begins on page 146 through 149 with the findings, is your general fund balance. The state stipulates per code that you can have a, an assigned, unassigned, and committed fund balance in your general fund compared to the current year operating revenues for just the general fund of five to 25%. Your calculations when everything is all said and done, we shook everything out, came to 26.1%. So you were slightly over. Uh, for us, that's probably a good thing. You have a, a excess money to go out and do some additional projects, but we do have to report the finding in accordance with the state compliance audit guide and whatnot. Overall, we think the city is well run, well managed. We appreciate your efforts as council and management. If we do have recommendations, we know that the city is usually on top of those and implements them right away. So thank you for having us tonight. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Robert, for your report on that. So, Mayor, members of the council, our rec my recommendation would be that uh, the audit committee has reviewed the report and the reports from the independent auditor and we would recommend that the council pass a motion accepting the audit reports and the comprehensive annual financial report for review. Thank you. Okay. Council, you didn't have any questions, correct? Okay. Then I will uh, look for a motion. May, <clears throat> Madam Mayor, I'll make the motion to accept the audit report and uh, also the comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2020. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we accept that financial report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that's a unanimous, so we'll uh, accept that as and move forward. Okay, the, our uh, 
Next item up uh, is our public hearings. And we do have three items on the public hearing. And I think I just want to make clarification here for the council because I know we've kind of bounced back and forth on the way that we've kind of conducted the opening and closing of these. And um, I'm going to go with the recommendation and stick with this just so that you guys know that I think we need to open each one, act upon it, vote on it, or close it and vote on it so that it keeps it real clean. Um, we do have one item here that's already open, which we can deal with that. But um, so with that, I'll look for, uh, I'll turn the time over to Mr. Chad Wilkinson because he's actually going to be presenting all three of them. So Chad, if you want to start with the first one, I'd appreciate that. You bet. Thanks, Mayor, Council. This first item is um, part of a two-part process. We talked about the first part at your RDA meeting that we just held um, previous to this meeting, but it has to do with a uh, uh, resolution to convey some property from the city to the RDA. Now, just for the clarification of those that may be watching or in the audi audience, uh, the redevelopment agency is one of the functions of our city council acting in a different capacity, um, wearing a, a, di a different hat that has a different set of regulations that are uh, set in state code, uh, gives, gives some different guidelines and some additional flexibility um, for uh, redevelopment of areas that have been set aside as this one has for redevelopment. The the property in question, it's a, a, a number of parcels, about five parcels that are shown on your screen. Um, I'm going to close, go to that first one and then turn this slideshow on really quickly. It's about 2.96 acres. Those are the five parcels shown up on the, on the screen, uh, highlighted in red. You can see the existing rail line. Gentile Street runs through kind of the bottom middle portion of the property. Cross Street and Church Street come in. Uh, some of those properties are bounded by Church and Cross. The other one um, is an existing city-owned property to the west of Cross Street, north of Gentile Street. So those those are the properties that are in question. Um, transferring these properties um, was to the RDA as part of a, a redevelopment um, plan. Uh, for that area. These properties were originally acquired for this purpose, to facilitate redevelopment of these uh, properties in our downtown. And again, proper, transferring that to the redevelopment agency um, will give some additional uh, flexibility and, and ability to uh, develop or redevelop those parcels. Uh, this was this property was appraised. There was a value set at $2.2 million. Um, any type of a transfer to the RDA would include um, eventually through um, the the development plans for this property, a, a plan to reimburse the city for those for that uh, cost, either through uh, sale of property or through um, use of tax increment, whatever the case may be. Uh, so, with that, the the staff is recommending that the council approve this conveyance. Uh, the the resolution for approval is resolution. 20-72, this is uh, subject to a public hearing as required in our local code. So if there's anybody here in the audience, it would be appropriate to take any kind of public comment that they may have. Um, after that, it would be appropriate to act on this item. I will say, just for the benefit of those who are just joining us now or the public that have just entered the room, that this was uh, uh, part of our redevelopment agency meeting earlier in the, in the evening and that the redevelopment agency did approve this contingent on the council approving this conveyance. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, council, do you have any questions for the open public hearing? Yeah, I do. Just one, Chad. Uh, Lon mentioned in the RDA meeting that this, and you just mentioned here, it uh, increases the flexibility in zoning and development ability from it going from the city to the RDA. Can you speak to specifics of what type of flexibility that provides? Yeah, redevelopment agencies just in state code are given um, additional flexibility in order to, one of the big challenges with um, redevelopment of of older parts of town is is just what we're talking about, which is purchase and consolidations of property. So redevelopment agencies are given additional um, flexibility when it comes to the purchase and sale of properties to facilitate those types of, of transactions. Um, it also gives some, some flexibility on the ability to negotiate with um, private developers who may have an interest in those, those properties and developing those. Okay. Any other questions? If not, I'll look for a motion to open the public hearing for item number A. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that the public hearing be opened for resolution 20-72. So those in the audience, 
uh, if you w wish to speak to this uh, particular item, you're welcome to come to either one of the podiums and uh, state your name and address for the records and your comments. Okay, seeing that there's none here, I do know that uh, we also uh, have the flexibility of people posting their questions online to us or in which we had pre uh, those would have need to have been submitted by 3 p.m. today and I believe uh, Mr. Crane is with us attending uh, via phone so he's generally the one that stays on top of that so Mr. Crane do we have any uh, comments or questions regarding our item number A on our agenda? No Mayor there are no uh, questions online. Okay thank you very much. Okay, seeing that there's no questions, then council, we I look for a motion to close this uh, item number A and uh, take action regarding resolution 20-72. Well, Madam Mayor, I move that we close the public hearing um, on resolution 2072. And I move that we approve resolution 2072 the conveyance of property from Layton City to the Redevelopment Agency of Layton City as presented. Second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. I'll take a roll call vote on this. Councilman Thomas? Um, yes. Morris? Aye. Councilman Fitzpatrick? Aye. Councilman Boxham? Aye. Councilman Day? Yes. Okay, there you have it, it's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson. Okay, we'll move on to item number B, which is the rezone request. And this particular item, I do know that the public hearing is still open. We had opened this uh, to, uh, in our last meeting. So if you'd like to go ahead and uh, give us a refresher on that, that'd be great. Madam Mayor and Chad, um, I, own a, I currently own a piece of property or in the midst of buying a piece of property that's subject Mary's Meadows, which is due north of this uh, potential zone request. So as I did last time, I, I am going to recuse myself from any of the deliberations and discussions of this uh, matter and will rejoin the council as soon as uh, action has been taken. Okay, thank you. I'll acknowledge that. Madam Mayor, uh, last meeting I disclosed some business dealings that I do have with the applicant. Uh, they do not uh, cause a conflict with this property decision. However, to avoid any perceived conflict, I as well am gonna recuse myself from the decision tonight. Okay, I respect that. Thank you very much, Mr. Day. Okay, so we still have a quorum and we'll be able to proceed. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, Council. This is, uh, again, a continued public hearing that was held uh, a few weeks ago, several weeks ago, uh, for to consider a request for zone change from CP1 to M2. As a re just a brief review, this was uh, this request was reviewed by our planning commission uh, at one of their meetings. Um, it was found that this request was not consistent with the general plan designation for the property, and the planning commission recommended denial of this uh, zone change. Staff. Uh, concurs with that recommendation and, and we would have that same recommendation. Uh, at the last meeting, City Council uh, gave staff some direction to, uh, to between the time the, the continuance occurred and, and tonight's meeting to look into some of the uses that were allowed in M2 and M1 zones as well as to see if there were additional uses that could be added to our CP1 zone that was actually under consideration on that previous hearing. And we did that. Um, we looked at those uses, uh, spent uh, several hours after the, the last meeting looking at those various uses. I'm gonna go to a, just a little table really quick um, that shows some of our analysis of, of those uses. One of the things that's important to note is that many uses that are allowed in the, the CP1 zone currently are uses that are also allowed in our uh, M1 and M2 zones. And I, I've got a list of those here. I'm, I'm gonna try not to make anybody motion sick by going through those too quickly, but you can see those uses on the screen. Those uses that are highlighted in gray are uses that are allowed in all three of those zone districts. So uh, there's already some, some pretty good flexibility uh, on use types. You've got some public uses here that, that are allowed in, in most of our zones. Uh, you've also got, again, quite a few commercial uses, some agricultural uses, uh, retail and, and, and service type uses that are already allowed in the CP1. One thing that we 
did note, um, and that was maybe not as clear in our last meeting, was that part of that last amendment was to look at um, light industrial type uses that would be appropriate in our CP1 zone. Um, we, we, we did look at those as part of a recommendation to you um, at that previous meeting, and so those uses were already included in that previous recommendation. It includes some light commercial flex manufacturing with some limits, um, some e-commerce retail and fulfillment um, uses with some limits, um, as well as some other uses that we described at our last meeting. So. With, with that, uh, we did take a look at those. Uh, subsequent to, to reviewing that, we determined that the uses that were still the most, the highest impact in those M1 and M2 zones, we were still uncomfortable with, that we wouldn't um, have any, it would, it would not be a recommendation to include those as uses in the CP1, and that um, based on the request, which was a change from CP1 to M2, that we weren't comfortable, we still weren't comfortable in recommending approval of that uh, change as staff, for the reasons we outlined and also um, with this additional review. Uh, we did meet with the applicant, um, focused mostly on reviewing the new uses that were allowed in the CP1 zone, <clears throat> with an emphasis on some additional options that were now available based on the amendment that you approved at your last meeting. Um, after that meeting, uh, we felt that uh, that there still wasn't um, agreement on that uh, that particular uh, zone um, and the, the, the existing zone from the applicant, and their desire was still to to move forward with with this M2 zone that allowed some of these additional uses. We had a tremendous amount of public interest um, in this zone change between the meet the last meeting and tonight, and we determined that it was important for us to reschedule this meeting for the, so the council could take action and uh, and come to a resolution on this request. Uh, so again, just to review, the planning commission did recommend denial of the request that's before you tonight for a change from CP1 to. M2 based on uh, the request not complying with our, our general plan and also with the, some um, not being comfortable with some of the existing uses and the planned uses and the impacts from those use, to those uses from a zone change. Uh, with that, I, I'll end my presentation and be happy to answer any questions. Chad, uh, on the, the staff report that was in the, uh, the, meeting, for, the meeting for today, on page three, it talks about the public hearing that we had on November 19th. Mentions uh, that it was that we had the meeting, there were uh, property owners that were here, uh, expressed their concern, and then it said following the, the hearing, the city council voted unanimously with council blocks and recused to table the, the hearing to a date uncertain. That was not unanimous. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I failed to mention that in my previous comments, and I was going to do that in the work session as well. But just to clarify, yeah, that was that was the result of uh, someone uh, putting that staff report together that wasn't in attendance, unfortunately, and and we did have uh, some erroneous information. But yeah, just to clarify the vote, the vote was not unanimous to recommend um, continuing the the public hearing. Um, we had. Councilmember Morris and Councilmember Fitzpatrick that that voted against that uh, that motion to to uh, continue. Okay, all right, very good. So let me make one. Okay, so um, you don't have any questions, right? Just in office. Very good. Okay, then we can go ahead and move on to the public portion of this. Uh, I do want to make a quick statement here, though, because I believe last time that we had this meeting or was on this discussion, um, I believe we it was fully we fully heard everyone there. We spent a lot of time on it. Um, I feel like that uh, the last basically, I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is um, I just want to make sure that you folks understand that. We spent a lot of time discussing this item last time. We were at a kind of a, a concern of not taking the right action because we felt like we needed more time on it and would hope to come to a resolution. However, this is a public hearing. We're continuing that public hearing. And so therefore tonight, I ask that you do not repeat what we, what the items that you uh, had stated last time because uh, obviously, We've got them in our minutes. We recall that that um, conversation. So if you could just speak to new information, and I'm talking for both the applicant as well as any citizens here, and that if there's a group of you that uh, share the same type of view or new information, hopefully you, you've identified maybe one person that can be your spokesperson on behalf of the group. Um, in addition, 
I do want to acknowledge your emails. I know that several of you emailed the council as well as myself and the staff. And um, we've also received emails from the applicant. So, uh, you know, this item has not been taken lightly. And you can see by some of the action of the council members here tonight that they definitely listened to you. So with that, I want to go ahead and proceed with our public comment portion of this meeting, as well as I believe. Ms. Fitzpatrick, did you want to make a statement beforehand or are you good now? I think I want to do it now. Um, I'm actually kind of disappointed that we're at this point. Um, as Councilmember Morris and I didn't feel it was even appropriate to table, it should have been voted on last time. Um, I talked with our city attorney and he suggested that I, I'm okay to make these comments. Um, I served on the, the nine years on the planning commission and participated as co-chair of the Leighton Forward General Plan Committee. We had many, many meetings and a lot of community input into the process of developing this new general plan that was adopted last year. This plan is the guide for development as the city continues to grow. The issue before us tonight and two weeks ago is solely a rezone to take this parcel being discussed from the CP1 zoning to an M2 zoning. The general plan allows the CP1 zone to stay in, in place because it was already there when the general plan was done, but is, an, is anticipated as growth continues, the land may eventually be residential as the general plan suggests. The request to change to M2 is inconsistent with the general plan. To alter from this, we would need to acknowledge a mistake was made in the general plan, and I do not believe this to be the case. To allow the zone change and to deviate from the plan would lend us to spot zoning this parcel, which I feel is a very inappropriate thing to do because it would impact the entire city of Layton. This issue is not about, and I feel no further discussion at this meeting is needed on what could go in a CP1 zone to allow Mr. Hines to find a tenant for the property. I feel that this is an issue that he needs to pursue outside of this zone request and vote that is to occur um, before us tonight. Any discussion in the public hearing should focus solely on the issue at hand, and that is the M2 zone change. And my suggestion to my fellow council members is, is that we vote on this tonight and not belabor this any longer. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Fitzpatrick. So with that, I will uh, entertain anyone else that would care to make a comment on this rezone request. As stated earlier in the um, public hearing, if you wish to come up and make comment, you're welcome to go to either side of the podium here, state your name and address for the record. Okay, seeing that there's none in the audience, I will defer to Mr. Crane to make sure there has not been any anyone that uh, had sent any additional comments in today via the online. So, Mayor, there are none. Okay. Very good. Okay. With that, then, Council, I'll look. I'll call for a motion to close the public hearing, and uh, for action regarding item B as far as the rezone request, which is, as stated earlier by Councilmember Fitzpatrick, that it's uh, to not change the general plan plan from the CP1 to the M2 heavy manufacturing. So I'll look for a motion. Madam Mayor, I, I move that we deny the rezone request at 1370 West Gentile Street from CP1 to M2 Heavy Manufacturing. And close, the public, hearing. And close the public hearing. Thank you. I second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. So I'll t uh, with that, I'll go ahead and take a, uh, take a roll call vote on this. <laughs> so I'll start out with Council Member Day. Excuse me, Thomas. Sorry, I'm used to calling. That's okay. Dave works. <laughs> I know. I'm used to calling him Thomas. I agree with the request to deny. Is that the right? Deny. I want to say that right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Councilman Morris. Aye. Councilman Fitzpatrick. Aye. Okay. There you have it. You have the action on that uh, item number B. Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson, on that presentation. Retrieve our two yes. So now, yes, we can invite our other two council members back in. And certainly, uh, we only have one more item to go, but those in the audience, if you wish to stay,
please do. If not, you're welcome to leave as well. And thank you for voicing your opinions so that we know that as a council, we can act accordingly. Okay, council, we'll go ahead and move on to item number C, which is the amendment of the Layton City Municipal Code. And again, Mr. Wilkinson will be presenting that item to us. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, this is really the culmination of several months of effort. This is a comprehensive amendment to titles 15, 18, and 19 of the um, Municipal Code. And this was an effort that was started as a result of some conversations a little less than a year ago uh, from some, with some neighboring, or with some, some residents of Layton who had concerns over some of the development processes within the city. As staff reviewed some of our existing processes and ordinances, we did find that there was a need to clarify, to update, and to coordinate some of our development codes in order to provide uh, for, for a better um, uh, process and for a better um, more concise and more clarified standards within within the city, especially related to grading and drainage standards. So the uh, staff undertook a month-long effort. I said it made it sound like I said month-long. It was months-long effort. Um, <laughs> took took some some good time reviewing this very thorough um, review of these ordinances to clarify and coordinate titles 15, 18, and 19 related to the development of of properties within Layton City. Predominantly, these are cleanup and clarification items. Um, there are some items that that do uh, eliminate some uh, obsolete standards of the code. They also um, add some clarif clarifying language uh, in order for us to provide a better experience for developers and for uh, the actual administration of the ordinance um, by staff. Um, so. I'm not going to go through each of these. It's a pages long ordinance amendment or text amendment, but we do have, um, I'm here available to answer questions. Our city engineer is available here tonight to answer answer any questions you might have related to these amendments. That's I think that's the, the recommended course of action that I would uh, recommend rather than going through page by page. Uh, just to point out a couple of, of those changes though, I'm going to do this very, very quickly. Um, in title 15, we had some measures that were considered to be obsolete, um, that were uh, proposed to be removed from the code. These are related to some interceptor drains, terracing requirements that are just, they don't re reflect current and best standard and practices, so we've proposed that those be eliminated. And then in title, I'm not going to scroll there because I, I don't want to make, again, give motion sickness to those that are looking at this ordinance, but title 19, we had some, some changes to our way we calculate average slope. Um, the remainder of those additions were really, again, clarifying, um, bringing up to date, um, making terminology consistent throughout the code. And uh, we appreciate those of you that reviewed this. We did uh, send a copy of this to the council uh, previous to this meeting, and we did receive some comments back. We appreciate those. Those have been incorporated in the uh, version that's in your packet. Uh, if there's any additional questions that you may have, um, this is part of a a two-pronged effort. This is the first prong of that effort uh, to review this comprehensive look at our our titles 15, 18, and 19 to coordinate and clarify. The second prong will be to bring forward to the council at uh, a future date some proposed amendments to our sensitive lands ordinance and to our private street and private subdivision development standards. Uh, with that, I'd be. We are recommending approval, and there are just for the just for clarification. There are actually three pieces to this because we have three separate titles that are being amended. So we have three ordinances: 20-30, 20-31, and 20-40 that amend those respective ordinances. And I'll open up for any questions. Okay, Council, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, I have one, Chad. First of all, I'd like to commend you guys on all your work on doing it. I think you guys have done a pretty good job on it. And I know this was an important part. I, I would also request, before I forget, that uh, I think it would be beneficial for all the council if uh, sometime you could come back on the inspection part of things and just explain how inspections go, what changes you made through this process on the inspection side of it. I think that would be helpful for all of us. Um, my question on this is pay, uh, middle section 18, uh, page 33. Okay. 
It's going to take just a moment, sorry. You said page 33? Page 33, okay. yeah. Take the shortcut here. I'll give me 10 more pages. Okay, I think we're getting close. Yeah, so can you explain why we're scratching out that on the fencing? Because this is one issue that I've battled a bit through the years on the required fencing, especially against us agricultural guys. Um, the fences haven't always been put in when they should be, and it just seems like to me this has taken out one way to, and it may maybe just under that extension part, but I don't think we should eliminate anything that makes them put the fence in when they should. So I'm going to take a stab at this one, then I'll let Steve jump in if he'd like to. So the section that we're looking at right now is the installation of, of development fencing. Um, you can kind of, I'm going to read through that standard. Any fence that's required to be installed, either as a condition attached to the approval of development or required under Title 19, shall be completed within 30 days of completion of construction of any subdivision road. So that, again, we're talking about uh, in the development phase of, the, of a subdivision, uh, once those roads are in place, the uh, code gives the developer 30 days to install any of the required fencing. There's some extensions set forth in that number two. Um, it goes through and gives some authority. Um, you can see that the extensions are grant, can be granted by, by me or my designee in limited circumstances. There's some things that have to be in place for those extensions to be granted. Um, those, are, those are listed there. Um, We'd have to have a, sub, a grading plan that demonstrates that the topography or unique feature of the properties, um, the requirements of section one can't be met, um, can't be granted unless the applicant posts a bond in the amount sufficient to construct the required fencing, owns the properties on each side of the fence line where the fence is gonna be installed, and that the fence is uh, within an accepted PRUD, th that such properties within an accepted PRUD plan are subject to the foothill regulations. So there's some things that are already um, in place you know, it would have to be within a PRUD plan. It would have to be in foothill regulations for those things to apply. There'd have to be some topographic constraints for that extension to apply. Um, so we, and you can correct me, this was a months long process, so we're gonna have to go backwards in our brains a little bit, but, um, and, and Steve can jump in and correct where I've got this, uh, where I'm misremembering, but our feelings were that those, those criteria and those, um, specific things that have to be met, those specific findings we have to meet, would give us some um, additional, I guess, it, it would prevent this from being just a commonplace thing where someone out on flatland and in, uh, in the west part of our city could come in and request these because they certainly have to meet these standards in order for that extension to be granted. You want to add anything to that, Steve? Yeah, and I would just add that I believe this section, uh, that sentence that's being struck is actually in, in uh, disharmony with the state uh, law regarding building permit issuance, and so it's it, that's actually an unenforceable uh, condition that is being placed there. We can't uh, hold up a building permit because the 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 fence is not considered something required directly for the service of the home. So maybe if uh, Mr. Crane is on the phone, he could confirm that is the lawyer in the room. But but that was part of the the discussion. Was unfortunately we can't hold up a building permit for this particular item. So that's that's correct. It was, it was changed in the state law a couple of years ago. So we're just kind of catching up. Thanks, Gary. But to echo what, what Mr. Wilkinson said, it is, we, we feel like we still have items there that can be used to help receive or, or install that fencing and, and be able to make it happen in a timely manner. So number one under there gives that 30 days on the completion of a road. Yeah. So we in just, essence, you have to have a road finished to be, get a building permit, so they would only have 30 days after that, correct? Yeah, and part of this, you know, in, in a PRUD situation, we'd also have the additional um, tool of a development agreement that would allow us to, to have some conditions that, that uh, you know, they would agree to by development agreement for installation of some of those, those improvements. Well, we've just had numerous issues in the past, especially with us ag guys, that not happening, so I'm satisfied with number one if that's enforced. 
because it becomes a huge problem for us taking all their debris as soon as they start building. Okay. Yep, number one will still be in place. Okay. Any other questions? Very good then. Um, I'll look for action then to open this public hearing. <laughs> I move to open the public hearing, Mayor. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we open our public hearing uh, regarding the amendment of the Leighton City Municipal Code. For anyone left in the audience that would care to make a statement regarding this, you're welcome to come up to the podium. Okay. Seeing that there's none, and once again, I'll verify that we have not received any online. Mr. Crane, can you confirm that? Yes, uh, Mayor, there's none online. Okay, very good. So, Council, that brings us to the motion that we need to close our public hearing and take action regarding item number C of our public hearing, which is to amend the municipal code, the Layton City Municipal Code. I make a motion that we close the public hearing, but I have a question. Do we need to do three separate motions and vote on each one or just do it as one? The motion just needs to include all three of all those three ordinances. Of yep. Okay. So I'll make a motion that we amend the Layton City Municipal Code, Title 15, Building and Construction, Title 18, Land Use Development, and Title 19, Zoning, related to development standards and policies, Ordinances 2030, 20-31, and Ordinance 20-40. Okay. There's second. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second that we adopt the Municipal Code. I'll take a roll call vote on this. Councilman Bloxham? Yes. Councilman Day? Yes. Patrick? Aye. Councilman Morris? Aye. Councilman Thomas? Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you, Council. That was a unanimous vote. Uh, that now concludes our public hearing portion of our meeting. And under item number seven, un any unfinished business, uh, I'm actually going to call upon each one of you. I know that uh, we had a great time going out and acknowledging the lights and we kind of caught our citizens off, off guard by asking them if they'd like to s share a brief Christmas message. So I'm going to ask if he, each one of you would like to do that, knowing that this is our last meeting of the year and it's, last, and it's prior to Christmas. So Merry Christmas. And I'm going to excuse myself for about five minutes. Can I do that or do I need a second? <laughs> you know, if it's a matter of personal privilege, go ahead. Merry Christmas and all that Happy New Year. A better n year than this one. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah. I would just say 2020 has been rough on everybody. We've lost citizens in our community from uh, a disease we weren't expecting when we first took office in January and all of us brought together. Um, and so hopefully we can kind of bound together and remember what's most important you know, our families and our communities and, and trying to be a little bit kinder, a little bit uh, more patient, trying to be a little bit more in the Christmas season. And as a believing uh, Christian, trying to follow the things that, that Christ taught. So I hope everyone, whether you're a believer or not, that you have a good Christmas and then a happy new year. Very good. Sure. Yeah, I'd like to say, you know, Merry Christmas and, and agree with what's been said about this has been a really rough year um, for a lot of people. Um, like, like Zach said, we've lost people, but we've also had even more that have suffered through this, um, whether it's through illness or loss of jobs, not being able to pay their rent or food. But one thing that I, has really made this Christmas season better for me is to be able to see all of the community outreach that has occurred. Our, our citizens are absolutely wonderful in reaching out and helping one another. Um, it's been a very, very humbling, humbling thing to watch. Um, those that have are really helping those out who have not. And, and it's really my hope and, and prayer that 2021 brings us to a little bit more normalcy and that we continue the kindness that I think has been exhibited this Christmas season. Very well said. Mr. Morris, would you like to share? I'll, I'll echo uh, mm -hmm. Council Member Fitzpatrick and my sentiment exactly that there are many in our community who have uh, been 
rich, we've all been richly blessed, but there are many who haven't uh, felt um, the effects of this virus as much as, as others. And so many of us are in a, in a state of plenty. And my, my, my plea is to, is to reach out to others. Is to f f We've got some like this, that means others are, <laughs> the universe tends, tends to uh, uh, reach for a balance and, and there are those that are suffering, whether it's a, a loss of a job, their business has been lost, uh, obviously health issues, and those that are suffering from this, from this disease, uh, those that uh, are long haulers that are su still suffering from this disease, reach out to them, do what you can, uh, let's let's continue to, to, to be together. I love that we've been able to, to go out in the community with the lights project and and it's been it was enlightening and it was humbling to, to meet with to meet with citizens and, and to hear their stories of, of how they're coping during this time and trying to bring cheer to all of us. So as we're and I'll be quiet, as we're going through these lights over here across in the in the park as we're going through the community looking in those lights that's what that is that's our our citizens are trying to celebrate this season and with those lights and and maybe let's think about them as we as we travel through and and just merry christmas and a, and a happy new year thank you councilman day did you want to say something? yeah i just wanted to add one thing that came to my mind after and that was uh the slogan that was shared by the uh risa across america people the other day at the veterans wall and their slogan for this year would be good for all of us as a resolution kind of, and their slogan is to the effect of be the type of American that is worth fighting for. Very well said. Well, thank you, Council, for, for sharing your statements. Um, you know, I recall early on in March when we first was hit with this, I kind of uh, shared with on our video that I thought that this was a time for us to hit, it's kind of like the reset button that all of a sudden everyone had an opportunity to kind of reset their lives, simplify it, and embrace those things that truly matter to you. And I hope that we've all done that. So with that said, I will just say that Christmas is a time of tenderness of the past, courage for the present, and hope for the future. And I think that pretty much sums up 2020. So I want to wish all of our citizens a very Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and uh, we look forward to 2021. So I'll look for a motion to close our meeting, Council. So moved. <laughs> okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Francis, for all your help in uh, making this public for us.